I just want to thank and praise Yahweh Almighty, the one who sits high and looks low on me and all of you. And I'm really excited about this message. Um, I do believe that Yahweh gave it to me, so I pray that it go forth and do whatever Yahweh intends for it to do. And that being said, I'm going to get right into it. So this weekend is Memorial Day weekend. So when I say Memorial Day, what is the first thing that you think of? First thing. Food, cookouts. Some people think about the sales. It's like shopping days, right? Some of us think about vacation. It's like a three-day weekend. You know, we think about lazy days and doing nothing. But I want you to know that Memorial Day is not about any of those things. I mean, that's what it's become in our society, but that's not what Memorial Day is all about. Memorial Day is a day set apart to remember our fallen soldiers, those that have made the ultimate sacrifice, those that have lost their lives in service to their country. So I want to show you guys a little video just to give you a little bit of understanding about what Memorial Day is all about, because it's not about the cookouts and the parades and vacation time and shopping and you're not going to see any of that in this video. This is called Freedom is Not Free. is not free. As saints of the Most High, we understand this. We know that the gift of grace is free to you and me, but it wasn't free. It cost Yeshua his blood. It wasn't free to him. And Memorial Day is a secular holiday. Make no mistake, it does not have any religious connotation to it. But I do believe that this whole thing about making a day to remember comes from the word of Yahweh. Because we are a forgetful people. See, all through the scripture, we find memorials that Yahweh has set up to help us remember the things that Yahweh would have us to remember. For example, the rainbow. When the rainbow appears in the sky, we remember that Yahweh destroyed the whole world because of the wickedness of the world, right? But we also remember the promise that the rainbow stands for, which is he will never flood the world again, right? So it's a reminder, it's a, a memorial to the promise that Yahweh gave us. When we look at the children of Israel coming out of the wilderness and Joshua is leading the charge and they cross over the Jordan on dry ground, Yahweh has them take a stone from each of the 12 tribes and build a monument. And this monument becomes a memorial for Israel for all eternity, right? It's a memorial for them to remember what Yahweh brought them through and out of. Last week, Sister Teacher Beth 
spoke in great detail about the feast days. The feast days are memorials that Yahweh has set up to help us remember what he has done for us, what he is doing for us, and what he has yet to do for us. And if you were paying attention, you can see the salvation message, this so great salvation that we have as a result of the sacrifice that Yeshua made on our behalf. This so great salvation is played out through Yahweh's feast days, which is really sad for the first day church that doesn't recognize the feast days because they are the salvation plan, the plan of redemption laid out for us. Communion is also a memorial that Yahweh established. It's to cause us to remember Yeshua's broken body and shed blood. So memorials are not only a good thing, but they're a necessary thing lest we forget, right? So this Monday is Memorial Day. And on Memorial Day, we are supposed to pause for a moment and reflect on the many men and women who made the ultimate sacrifice to defend our freedoms. Memorial Day is a military holiday honoring fallen soldiers. So this Memorial Day, I want you guys to actually, in the middle of licking your fingers from the barbecue and all the stuff that you're doing, to think about the freedom that you have as a result of these brave, courageous heroes, these ones who are willing to defend our freedom. So that being said, it being a military holiday, and us being soldiers in the army of Yahweh, how many soldiers do I got in the ranks today? How many soldiers in Yahweh's army? We are his military, right? Soldiers in the army of Yahweh. So I declare today spiritual Memorial Day, right? Spiritual Memorial Day because... If the military can honor their soldiers, we can honor our soldiers as well, right? Because we are soldiers in the army of Yahweh. So today, we're going to honor those that have gone before us. Now, in the military, there's a saying, all gave some, some gave all, right? What that means is every person that enlists in the military will serve. They all serve, right? In some capacity, form, fashion, or other, they all serve. But some of them will serve unto death. Some of them will pay the ultimate price. See, the ones where it says all gave some, some people serve for a certain number of years and they retire. You know, some go AWOL, absent without leave. Some get discharged, whether honorably or dishonorably, but they don't stay in service until they die. The ones who gave all are the ones who died on active duty, the ones who died in service to their country. In Yahweh's army, those that follow the great soldier, and who knows who the great soldier is? Yeshua. He's the great soldier, right? So those that follow Yeshua will give all. You will give all. In other words, you will die an active soldier in Yahweh's army. See, there is no retirement in Yahweh's army. There is no honorable or dishonorable discharge in Yahweh's army. You will die in Yahweh's army. As a matter of fact, you will die on day one. In Yahweh's army, you will die on day one. The day that you accepted Yeshua's atoning sacrifice on Calvary for the remission of your sin is the day that you agreed to lay down your life for his. On that day, you made a profession of faith. On that day, you identified with Yeshua in death by being baptized into a watery grave. And you've been resurrected, hallelujah, into newness of life. And you no longer have a life apart from him. So in this army, you will die on day one. In this army, we will all give all. We will all die in service to Yahweh. So what I want to talk about today on our first annual Congregation of Yeshua Spiritual Memorial Day, right? 
Before we get into our memorial for our saints, I want to talk about death. You know, death is not something we tend to talk about too often. So today I want us to look at it a little bit closer. So my scripture today is coming out of Revelation chapter 14. So if you have your swords, turn there. Revelation is the unveiling of the second coming of Yeshua. That's what the book is about. It's the last book of the Bible, and it's heaven's last word about this world that we live in. My scripture today is going to be Revelation chapter 14, verses 12 and 13. Now I'm going to tell you, there's so much in these little verses, I could probably preach four different sermons out of this. Maybe more if I really get deep. You know what I mean? So I'm going to try to stay focused and not let myself go on these tangents, okay? So I'm reading out of the Amplified. Here is encouragement for the steadfast endurance of the saints, Yahweh's people, those who habitually keep Yahweh's commandments and their faith in Yeshua. Then I heard the distinct words of a voice from heaven saying, Right, blessed. Happy, prosperous, to be admired are the dead who die in Yahshua from now on. Yes, blessed indeed, says the Spirit, so that they may rest and have relief from their labors, for their deeds do follow them. Revelation 14, 12, and 13. You see, I have highlighted here, blessed are the dead. Blessed are the dead. I mean, that sounds weird, right? Because most times we don't view death as a blessing. We actually think it's just the opposite. It's something to be avoided, right? We don't want to die, right? It's something that is a curse according to scripture. We all want to live for as long as we can live, right? So what does blessed be the dead really mean? So this word blessed in the Strong's Concordance means makarios, which means happy, blissful, serene, fulfilled, content. Happy are the dead. That tells me that there is life after death. See, there's not this nothingness. There's life after death. It's satisfaction, fulfillment, a reality that is fully content and serene. Happy are the dead. I think about that, it don't even sound right coming out of my mouth, right? Happy are the dead, blessed are the dead, fulfilled are the dead, satisfied are the dead, blissful are the dead, right? We associate death with dying and suffering, heartache and pain. You know, we don't associate happiness with those things. We don't associate happiness with funerals and cemeteries, right? We view death as a negative. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 25 and 26, it says, For Messiah must reign as king until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be abolished and put to an end is death. Death is an enemy to Yah because he's a God of the living, right? He's a God of life, right? So death is the enemy of Yahweh. But here in Revelation, a voice from heaven says, blessed or happy are the dead. But I want you guys to understand that the verse doesn't just stop right there. See, we got to finish the verse. This is a conditional blessedness, right? Not everybody's death is a blessing. The scripture goes on to say, those who die in Yeshua, those who die in Yeshua are the ones that are blessed or the dead. Not those that die apart from Yeshua. See, this is what Yeshua has provided for us through his resurrection. Because he lives, we shall live also. Because he has eternal life, we will have eternal life. He's the first fruits, and those that follow after him will also be resurrected into that eternal life. Blessed are the dead who have a personal relationship with Yeshua, those who trust in Yeshua, those who believe he is who he says he is, those who believe he did what he said he did, those that know that he's working in your life right now, and those that believe he will do what he said he was going to do, that the promises that the scripture speaks about belong to you. Do you believe it, saints? Blessed are those 
In this context, the promise of blessing and death is given to the saints in the end times. In Revelation, we're talking about tribulation. We're talking about persecution of the saints, the worst persecution the church will ever know. During this time, many people will be martyred. Now, let me explain a martyr real quick. A person who's a martyr is a person who dies for the faith. Now, make no mistake, as a soldier in the army of Yahweh, we will all die in the faith, right? But a martyr is a person who dies for the faith. In other words, they had an option. They had an out. They had an escape route. All they had to do was denounce their God and they could live. But they chose to stand on their profession of faith and die for his glory. Hallelujah. They are the martyrs, the ones who die for the faith. We will all die in the faith, but some of us may be required at some point in our life to die for the faith. In the midst of this horrible time, persecution of the saints, where they can't buy and sell, they can't feed their children, they can't own land or homes, they got to flee to the hills. In this time, this blessing comes. Blessed are the dead. Now, that may seem cold and uncaring to somebody who doesn't understand the gospel message, to somebody who doesn't know the truth, to somebody who doesn't believe that the promises the scripture speaks about belong to them. But blessed are the dead. There are two truths or facts that contribute to the blessedness of those who die in Yeshua. Two truths in these verses. Two. The first one is how they live. Blessed are the dead for how they lived, right? And the second is how they died. Blessed are the dead for how they died, right? So looking at verse 12 again, here is the encouragement for the steadfast endurance of the saints. Steadfast endurance of the saints. Believers live with perseverance. The scripture says those that endure to the end shall be saved. True saving faith is enduring faith. It's persevering faith. It's faith that presses and pushes and stays. True faith. That's what it's talking about, perseverance. When you have this type of perseverance, that means it doesn't matter what the enemy puts before you, how he tries to trip you up, strongholds and stumbling blocks and snares. It matters not because you got your eyes on the prize. And you're not going to let anything hinder you from reaching out and touching the hem of his garment. You're going to press, push, and do whatever you got to do. Perseverance. This is what these saints in the end times will have. I want you to understand this is not a command. This does not command us. This is not a statute or a mandate. This is a statement of fact. It's a fact that true saints persevere. And this is said in the context of the end times when all hell is breaking loose. This truth teaches us that those who are true believers in Yeshua will persevere in faith even in the worst of times. Those who have saving faith will never lose it. It will never disappear. It will never dissipate. It will never wax cold. It will never stop believing. It will never stop trusting. It will never stop obeying. This is the faith that Yahweh gives us. Enduring faith. True saving faith. Faith that perseveres. They will endure no matter what is happening to them. They will endure no matter what is going on around them. No matter how severe the persecution gets, they will hold fast to their faith. Because Yahweh gives us true, saving faith, a faith that endures. The question is, do you have true, saving faith? Or are you like a leaf in the wind blowing to and fro? Things don't go your way. And all of a sudden, your faith is gone. Did it ever exist in the first place? How many people in here got fair weather faith? Do you know what fair weather faith is? Fair weather means when the sun is shining and Yahweh is raining down blessings on me. I can say hallelujah. I can praise him and tell people about him and stomp and clap and do all of that. 
But then when the storms of life come, and let me tell you something about the storm saints. The storms are no respecter of person. The storms of life hit all of us. Black, white, male, female, rich, poor, Jew, Gentile, born free, it matters not. The storms of life affect us all. When the storms of life come, do you forget Yahweh? Do you take matters into your own hands and try to make something happen? Things ain't moving fast enough for you. Yahweh ain't opening the doors you want them to open. So you start opening your own doors and trying to make a way for yourself. You get ahead of Yahweh. You lead and bring him with you. Is that what happens? Or how about these saints? Stuff don't go well in their life. Storms come. And they curse Yahweh. Curse Yahweh. Act deserving of something. Why is this happening to me, Yahweh? But when it was sunshiny and blessing, there wasn't no why me. Fair weather faith. Fair weather faith is not saving faith. Fair weather faith will not endure to the end. Fair weather faith is not Yahweh's faith. The reality is that if you have true saving faith, you've been regenerated. The scripture says that we are transformed more and more into the image and likeness of our king. Hallelujah. The scripture says that we have been renewed in our mind. We've been regenerated. We've been brought back to that original state that Adam and Eve had when Yahweh walked with them in the garden. The reality is that a regenerated people will continue in faith till the very end, no matter what is happening. The faith of a true believer will persevere because that is the nature of saving faith. It can't be anything else. Saving faith has no quit in it. The saints who live during the end times with all the horrible stuff happening will survive with their faith intact till the end. It's going to be so bad, saints. So bad that Yeshua says he has to shorten that time and let everyone be destroyed. If you're struggling to hold on to your faith right now, there's little hope for you to stand during the persecution of the church. If we're not willing to live for him, we will not die for him. You think about what Yeshua did for you. He was willing. He was willing to suffer a horrible death. With every lash, every thrust of the hammer, every mock, every spit, every punch, every kick, every splinter in his back, he could have stopped, called a legion of angels down to rescue him, but he willed himself. But we have such a hard time giving our all. We hold on to the stupidest of things. Yahweh tells us to put something down and we just, uh, tug of war, we don't want to. But no, y'all, I need it, I need it. You don't need it. You need Yahweh. That's all you need. You don't need these vices. You don't need these distractions. You don't need more money and more stuff. You don't need these things. You need Yahweh. True saving faith holds on no matter what is going on in your life. Those who remain in Yeshua are loyal. Are you loyal to Yahweh? They will not fall prey to the lies and the deception what the enemy is selling. They won't allow the enemy to sow seed of doubt in their mind. True saving faith. Satan cannot, will not, shall not destroy them. True saving faith perseveres. Our faith overcomes the world. That's what the scripture says in 1 John. True faith perseveres, past, present, and future. Now, we've been talking about the future saints in Revelation, but let's take it back for a minute. Let's look at the past saints, because I want you to understand that true saving faith was from the very beginning. From the very beginning, before Yahshua, they had true saving faith. If you look at Hebrews chapter 11, it's called the Hall of Faith. 
all of these people died in faith. In verse 13, it says all these died in faith. In other words, they hadn't yet received the promise or seen the fulfillment of the promise because Yeshua had not yet come. But they all died in faith. So if we look at Hebrews chapter 11, 32 to 40, this is what happened to these people who are listed in the hall of faith. And what more shall I say? For time will fail me if I tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David, and Samuel, and the prophets, who by faith, that is, with an enduring trust in Yahweh and his promises, subdued kingdoms, administered justice, obtained promised blessings, closed the mouths of lions, extinguished the power of raging fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became mighty and unbeatable in battle, putting enemy forces to fight, women to flight, women received back their dead by resurrection and others were tortured to death, refusing to accept release, offered on the condition of denying their faith so that they would be resurrected to what? A better life. They were stoned to death. They were sawn in two. They were lured with tempting offers to renounce their faith. They were put to death by the sword. They went about wrapped in skins of sheep and goats, utterly destitute, oppressed, cruelly treated, people of whom the world was not worthy, wandering in deserts and mountains and living in caves and holes in the ground. And all of these, though they gained divine approval through their faith, did not receive the fulfillment of what was promised because Yahweh had us in mind and had something better for us so that they, these men and women of authentic faith, would not be made perfect. That is completed in him apart from us. Hallelujah. Apart from us. True, saving faith. They went through death, torture, imprisonment, withstood fierce temptation. A lot of them became martyrs. They survived every type of hardship. And we whimper at the smallest of challenges. We forsake Yahweh over the smallest of things. This, saints, is true saving faith. If you go into chapter 12, chapter 12, he says, verse 1 and 2. Now, it's coming off of chapter 11, which is talking about these people, the hall of faith. We're talking about people in the Old Testament who lived for Yahweh, who had faith in Yahweh, who had not yet seen Yahshua, did not see the promise fulfilled, who were willing to undergo these great atrocities, but held fast to their faith. In chapter 12, it says, therefore, because of all of that, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses who by faith have testified to the truth of Yahweh's absolute faithfulness, stripping off every unnecessary weight and the sin which so easily and cleverly entangles us, let us run with what? Endurance and active persistence, the race that is set before us, looking away from all that will distract us and focusing our eyes on Yeshua, who is the author and perfecter of faith, the first incentive for our belief and the one who brings our what? Our faith to maturity, who for the joy of accomplishing the goal set before him endured the cross, disregarding the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of Yahweh, revealing his deity, his authority, and the completion of his work. Hallelujah. We got a cloud of witnesses, saints. All of those that have gone on before us, all of those who have died in active duty to the service of the kingdom, they have witnessed it for us. I want you to know that people had to die for this gospel message to live. If there weren't people willing to die, the message would have been lost. They paved the way for us. Yeshua is the author and the finisher of our faith. True saving faith is what we're talking about. All of these died in faith under horrible persecution. Verse 12 goes on to say, keep the commandments of Yahweh and keep your faith 
in Yeshua. I want you to understand that these two things are characteristics of a true believer. That's what true believers do. Obedience is always the evidence of true saving faith. Obedience to the word is the mark of salvation. If you are not walking in obedience to the word of Yahweh, you are not saved. Not only do they obey the word of Yahweh, but they trust. They keep their faith in Yahshua. They are loyal to him. Even when they don't agree, they do what the word says. Even when they don't understand, they do what the word says. They submit themselves to Almighty Yahweh in his will, his plan, his way, his purpose. They don't get ahead of him. They don't take matters into their own hands. They do what Yahweh tells them to do and no more. The Old Testament saints were faithful unto death, looking forward to the one who hadn't even come yet. They were living in hope. We who are on the other side of Calvary, we're looking back at what he has done and looking forward to what is to come, his second coming. We are trusting that the word of Yahweh is true and correct and everything that he said will happen will happen. That's the nature of saving faith, enduring, obedient, and trusting. Just like the saints in Hebrews 11 and saints to come in Revelation, all of us, all of us, if we stay in Yahshua, we will receive this blessed are the dead based on the way that we live. If we live trusting in Yahshua, if we live holy as he is holy, if we live a righteous life, if we live that set apart life, if we live purposely, if we live to bring glory to Yahweh, if we live with his joy as our strength, if we live productively, not in this world, but productive for the kingdom, if we live like that because he has transformed us to do that, we will be counted among that cloud of witnesses and people will speak of us and say, blessed are the dead. Living a righteous life is its own reward. It's a blessing in and of itself. Let me tell you, saints, if there was no heaven, this would still be the best way to live. Hallelujah. But there is a heaven. There is a heaven for those who are in Yeshua. So when death comes, and it will surely come, we can say, blessed are the dead. Hallelujah. So the number one truth or fact is that to live in Yahshua is a blessing. So blessed are the dead who lived in Yahshua. They lived with perseverance, trusting and obeying. But there's a second truth, which we'll look at in verse 13. The way that they died. Blessed are the dead for how they die. Now the scripture says it is appointed unto all men to die. Unless you are alive when Yeshua returns, we will all taste death, right? We will all taste death. But know this, saints. We die with promise. We die with promise. Now this next part is just really going to excite y'all because I kid you not, it excited me. And I'm not easily excited, I don't think, but it excited me. And I was ready to run out and tell everybody. Now, God, pay close attention. I don't want to lose anybody. So if you was falling asleep, get up. Get up and look at this. Verse 13. He says, Right. I heard a voice from heaven saying, Right. Blessed. Happy, prosperous to be admired are the dead who die in Yahshua from now on. Yes. Blessed indeed, says the Spirit, so that they may rest and have relief from their labors, for their deeds do follow them. The Spirit says, yes, hallelujah. The Spirit says, yes. Do you understand what I'm saying? Why is the Spirit saying yes? I want you to think about it like this. Who was it that convicted you of your sin before you were saved? Who was it that gave you new life? Who was it that regenerated you? Who lives inside of you? Yeshua said, I go away so that the comforter may come, so that my Father in heaven and I can make our abode in you. Who lives inside of you? Who is leading? 
leading you and guiding you and directing you? Who is teaching you all things? Who has given you the power to overcome your flesh? Who equips you to walk in obedience to the word? Who is your strength in every trial and temptation? Who comforts you in your sorrow? Who strengthens you in your weakness? We're talking about the Holy Spirit, saints. And when you die, the spirit will say, yes, hallelujah. Yahweh and Yahshua in me will say, yes, hallelujah. The spirit says, yes, hallelujah. That's his divine amen when he gets you there. You can't get there without the Holy Spirit. This is his amazing affirmation. This is his approval. This is, the, this is the thing that sealed you. The scripture says in Ephesians, we are sealed by the Spirit until the day of redemption. He will keep you until the day of redemption. And when you stand before the Father, and we all will stand before a holy, holy, holy God and give an account of our life, the Spirit, oh, hallelujah, the Spirit of Yahweh, hallelujah, will say yes, yes. Hallelujah! It is the Spirit that takes us into that next realm. The Spirit of Yahweh. Yes! We die in Him. The Spirit bears witness and says, Yes! Blessed indeed! Hallelujah! Yes! Yes! Verse 13 goes on to say, We rest from our labors. What does that word labor mean? The word here is kapon which means physical weariness, literally to wear yourself out, to toil, to struggle. Part of the definition is trouble. So it's talking about all the troubles of life, the struggling to live righteously in a fallen and corrupt world. You will rest from all of that. You will no longer have to contend with your sinful flesh. You will no longer have to contend with the distractions of the world. You will no longer have to struggle. See, all the struggle and disappointment, anxiety, fear, doubt, shortcoming, unfulfillment, dissatisfaction, all of that is gone forever. That's why in the kingdom there's no more sorrow, no tears, no pain, no suffering. When the Spirit says, yes, you won't have to struggle anymore, hallelujah. Verse 13 goes on to say that their deeds follow them. I want you to know that your deeds will follow you not only in this life, but in the life to come. So in this life, everybody who dies leaves a legacy. See, the Bible tells us the story of all of these people who lived long ago. And they left a legacy for us. They left something for us to see. We can see good examples and we can see bad examples and we can learn from both, right? So the question is, what kind of legacy are you going to leave? Are you going to leave a good legacy or are you going to leave a bad legacy? When you're gone, are people going to speak highly of your representation of Yeshua or are they going to wonder if you even made it into glory? What kind of legacy are you leaving? The saints that have gone on before us have left us a powerful legacy. But these deeds also follow us into the kingdom. Their deeds follow them. Now, what does that mean? How do my deeds follow me into the kingdom? This is talking about our reward. This is talking about our reward. In 2 Timothy 2, I mean 4, 6 to 8, he says, for I am already being poured out as a drink offering. And the time of my departure from this world is at hand, and I will soon go free. This is Paul talking. I have fought the good and worthy and noble fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith, firmly guarding the gospel against error. In the future, there is reserved for me the victor's crown of righteousness for being right with Yahweh and doing right, which Yahweh, the righteous judge, will award to me on that great day, and not to me only. This is where it pertains to you, saints, and not to me only, but also to all those who have loved and longed for and welcomed his appearing. Hallelujah. Your deeds will follow you. 
Your kingdom work in this realm will earn you a crown in glory. Hallelujah. Your deeds will follow you. Blessed are the dead who persevere in faith and are destined for glory. Are you living a life of enduring faith? Is your faith persevering so that you may die a death full of promise? The promise is eternal rest. The promise is reward, the best that Yahweh can give. That's why Yeshua died. That's why he rose again. He conquered death for us. The scripture says the perishable, this flesh, will put on imperishable. The mortal will put on immortality. The word says death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is the law. But thanks be to Yahweh, hallelujah, who gives us victory through Yahshua. In him there is rest. Rest. Apart from him, your struggles will go on forever. Forever. There will be no rest. There will be no reward. There will only be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Outer darkness and isolation. Cursed are those that die that way. Why are you dying when Yeshua made a way for you to live? Why are you dying when Yeshua made a way for you to live? Cursed are those that die that way. But blessed are those that die in Yeshua, for they will enter into eternal rest. Today is our spiritual memorial day. We talked about the saints in the Bible and the legacy they left. But I want you to know between then and now, a whole lot of stuff has happened. I like to read Fox's Book of Martyrs because it shows me just how much I haven't surrendered, how much of my life I'm still holding on to, the things that I'm not willing to relinquish to the Most High. I encourage you guys to read it if you've never read it. These saints, they were like so committed, so dedicated, so unmoved, no matter what the persecution was. There's a story in there about the Colosseum, when they used to take the Christians and they used to throw them in the Colosseum and let the lions and the tigers eat them up for the entertainment of the Roman citizens. Not only were these saints willing to die this horrible death, they were willing to let their kids die too. There's a story in there where they took sheepskin and put them on the children and threw the children in the Colosseum with animals that hadn't been fed in a week. And the animals just destroy these kids for the gospel because they refused to renounce Yahweh. All they had to do was renounce Yahweh and they could live, but they refused. They loved Yahweh more. And I think about this all the time, you know, being a mom. I think about this all the time, like how could they be, you know, willing to let go of the thing they treasure the most, the thing they love the most in this world? You know, you think about this and you think about the stuff in your life that you're not willing to relinquish. The stuff you're still holding on to that Yahweh's telling you to put down. You're making excuses. You're justifying your bad behavior. You're minimizing it. You don't want to let it go. But, but these saints who had true, saving, enduring, persevering faith, these saints were willing to give up the thing they treasured most in this life. See, as a parent, you might make a decision to die so your kids can live. But would you be able to make a decision to die and watch them die too? That's the faith they had. And I think about it, and I'm like, Yahweh, like, how were they able to do that? I don't know if I would be able to do this. Like, you know, and I thought about it, but Yahweh, oh, hallelujah. He gave up his son. He gave up his beloved, his treasure, the thing he valued the most. He allowed his son to come and die a horrible death. He watched as people spit on him and mocked him and beat him and stripped him and did all kinds of wickedness to him. And he had the power to stop it, but he didn't. 
Just like those Christians had the power to stop it. All they had to do was renounce their God and they could live and their children could live, but they didn't. They didn't stop it. And Yahweh, he didn't. He didn't stop it. He allowed Yeshua to continue on because, oh, hallelujah, because as much as he loved his son, Yeshua, as much as he treasured his only begotten, he saw you, hallelujah, and he thought you worthy, hallelujah, and he allowed his son to die for you while you were yet his enemy hallelujah while you were yet his enemy he saw worth in you he saw value in you he deemed you redeemable hallelujah but what's wrong with us Yahweh was willing to give up his treasure his heart his true love his son for his enemy but when Yahweh tells you to put something down, not even as valuable as your children, you don't want to do it. Is Yahweh not worthy? He deemed us worthy while we were yet his enemy, but is Yahweh not worthy? Is he not worthy of our all? Did he not give us all his blood, his sweat, his tears, his reputation, his dignity, his everything? Is he not worth it? You may not say it out of your mouth, Yahweh, you're not worth it, but your actions say, Yahweh, you're not worth it. He tells you to put that down, don't do that, stay away from that, stop doing this, separate from that. But you won't do it because he's not worthy. He's not worthy. But if you had true saving faith, hallelujah, he'd be worthy of that and more, hallelujah. You give it all for him just like he gave it all for you. True saving faith. There's a story in the Fox's Book of Martyrs called the 40 Martyrs. These 40 guys were in the military, and the Roman emperor found out they were Christians. So he decided to punish them. He threw them in prison, told them they needed to renounce their God and worship their idols, and they refused. He got upset. He stripped them all down naked and put them out on a lake in the dead of winter. And then he put temptation all around them. He put warm baths on the shore. And he said, whenever you're ready to renounce your God, you can come get warm and worship our idols. And the 40 men stood out there on the ice and they sang praises to Yahweh. And one by one, they began to fall. They began to die, being subjected to the elements. But there was one soldier who got a little weak. He decided he couldn't do it. He decided he wasn't going to stand with the other 39. And he decided he was going to go to the shore. But the amazing thing, the miracle in all of this is there was a Roman soldier who was guarding them. And the Roman soldier saw what was going on. And when this man came ashore, this Roman soldier, he saw something. He saw something in these men. He saw their resolve to die for their profession of faith. He saw something and he wanted what they had. He stripped off his clothes and he went out there on the lake and he died with those men. The 40 martyrs. Do we have that kind of faith? The kind of faith that people would look at us and desire to have what we have. The kind of faith where people would say, I want what you got. I kid you not, saints, this is my true testimony. I stand here today before you because I saw something in my husband that I wanted. I want what you got. He represented the light of Yahweh before me. In spite of all of my resistance and all of the struggle, he stayed before me, preaching the gospel, encouraging me, showing me scripture. I saw his faith early in our marriage when he believed that my daughter was fine and I was doubting everything. Yahweh, where are you at? Why aren't you fixing this? His faith. I wanted what he had. Hallelujah. I got what he got. I got what he got. Hallelujah. I got my own faith. I stand on my own profession now. Because Yahweh is good. Do people look at you and want what you got? Or do they wag their head at you? You call yourself a saint. Look at you. You're a mess. Worse than me. I kid you not. People who profess to be living for Yahweh, people who profess to be believers, you do more harm to the kingdom when you have a half-hearted walk. When you're lukewarm, you do more harm to the kingdom than the lost. You do more harm. That's why the scripture says if you're lukewarm, he will spit you out of his mouth. You are either in or you are out. Quit trying to play the fence. 
You cause other people to fall. You become a stumbling block instead of a stepping stone. Today is our spiritual memorial day. So we talked about the saints of the Bible. We talked about some of the martyrs. I could go on day talking about the martyrs. I mean, there's a whole book about them. I could tell you a hundred stories about the martyrs. All equally wow from the next. But I want to bring it personal. Today is our spiritual memorial day for the congregation of Yeshua. We have saints that have died in active duty for the kingdom of Yahweh, who died in faith. So I want to close this message by remembering them, by honoring them. Because, see, they left a legacy that still lives today in this church. Whether you knew them or not, they planted in us and invested in us, and we carry that now. We carry that now. Sister Gaines, a lot of y'all don't know her because she was old when I came. And that was like 20 years ago. She was like 80 or something. And I'm going to tell you what I know about Sister Gaines. She was old and she was frail. But she has such a zeal and enthusiasm for the things of Yahweh. She stood on her feet through the service to praise him every song. She could teach you young people who sit on your butt and don't got a praise to give how to praise. She would be out of her seat. She would be hallelujah. She'd be like, Can you, Jamie could do it. I can't imitate her. She would do it again, Jay. She would do that all the time, right? But I'll tell you what I learned from her. She outlived one of her children. She even outlived a grandchild. And through such great loss, she praised Yahweh. Yahweh never not got praise. Even through the greatest of grief she experienced, she still was faithful to Yahweh and his church. To Yahweh and his church. She didn't let that be a reason to not come, to separate herself, to not be here. Sister Gaines. Uncle Casper. Uncle Casper was a prophet in the church. The crazy thing is, a lot of the things he prophesied over my life, he didn't live to see the fulfillment of those things. But I did. He was a true prophet. He was a true prophet. Because when I came in here and I didn't know the first thing about the Bible, he told me I would preach the word. I laughed at him. See, he saw something in me I never knew was even there because Yahweh gave it to him. He was a prophet. He was blind, but he saw me. Hallelujah. He saw me. I learned from him that he, was, he had bad feet, you know, really bad feet. They wanted to cut his feet off a couple times, but he wouldn't let them. And he was in pain, and feet hurt him, you know what I mean? But when he would get caught up in the spirit, he would get out of that wheelchair and jump on them feet, just like me and you. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. And I used to look at him like his feet don't really hurt. He just... What's up with him? He, come on now. He, you know. But he showed me that when you are so in communion with Yahweh, your physical circumstances do not hinder you or affect you. Uncle Casper. Aunt Edna. Aunt Edna had a gift of song. She sang like an angel. She's one of the singers in the assembly. And I don't even know if you guys realize it or not, but we kind of honor her legacy quite often in this church because she's the one who wrote Yahweh Is. We used to close every service with that song, Yahweh Is, Sweeter Than Honey. She wrote that song. Yahweh gave it to her. And guess what? We shared that song with other assemblies, and they sing her song too. Her legacy lives on beyond her. What kind of legacy are we leaving, right? Sister Aunt Edna had a stroke. When she had her stroke, her, her voice was slurred. Her speech was severely slurred. Not a little bit slurred, a lot slurred. And she didn't have use of one whole side of her body. But she would come to church always happy, always smiling. And she would get up and she would still sing. And it didn't sound as good as before the stroke. But to Yahweh, it was angelic. To Yahweh, it was her offering before him. And what I learned from her is 
I don't, it doesn't matter how we look. You know, people coming into the church would hear like, what is she doing? She, you know, she was giving Yahweh her gifting in spite of how she looked or how she may have felt or, you know, and that's what we need to do. Quit sitting on our gifts. We need to get up and give Yahweh his due because he's worthy. Give him his glory, hallelujah. He's worthy. It doesn't matter how you look. It doesn't matter how other people perceive it. It's between you and your God. That's what Sister Edna left with me. Share your gift, Denise. Don't worry about if you look foolish or not. Yahweh is the one who's the audience, not the saints. Aunt Edna. Brother Willie Young. Brother Willie Young is Sister Gaines' son. He was a minister in a church when I first came. This man was a walking concordance. He knew the Bible better than all of us put together. He knew it back and forth and forth and back. If you asked him something, he would tell you book, chapter, and verse without cracking the Bible. I mean, he ate the word. He knew the word. It was, it was kind of frustrating when he would do his messages because he would have a hundred scriptures and he would make us turn to every single one of them. And his sermons would be long because we had to turn to every single one of them. But what I realized through that is people need to read the word for themselves. See, it's one thing for me to stand up here and tell you what the word says, but then you can take it or leave it because I'm the messenger and you don't necessarily receive it as a word from Yahweh. But when you read the word for yourself, the spirit of Yahweh will bear witness with you of what you need to do. And that's what he taught me. Brother Willie was so patient with me. When I first came, I was ridiculous. I was horrible, you know. I'm a questioning person. I questioned everything. I challenged everything. I made him prove every single thing he believed, every single thing. And he would get frustrated with me. He would throw his hands up, but he never quit. He never gave up on me. So I kid you not, when some of y'all frustrate me, and yes, y'all do, and I get tired and don't want to deal with you, and I'm like, I'm done. I ain't the pastor. It ain't my job. I ain't talking to him no more. Brother Willie's voice comes in my ear, and I think about the fact that he never quit on me. To his dying day, he never quit on me. He poured into me. He invested in me. He trained me up. And I'm telling you, what kind of legacy are we leaving? Brother Willie Young, Sister Eleanor, Sister Eleanor, she had a gift of discernment. She was a watchman over the assembly. She discerned things in the spirit. I used to listen to her tell people stuff, and it always came to pass. She had, like, the gift of knowing stuff. You know, I mean, she literally would be at home and call me and tell me something about one of my kids, and then it would happen. It's like, is there cameras in my house or what? Like, how does she know what is happening over here? She had a true gift, the gift of discernment. But one of the things I learned from her, she used to travel a lot. She traveled a lot by bus, by train, by plane, whatever. And in her travel, she always talked to people about the gospel. Always. She didn't know them. She just met them. But she left them with the word of Yahweh. And what I learned from her was there's all kinds of opportunities for us to share the gospel message. And how many missed opportunities do we have? Because we're uncomfortable, because we don't know them or you know, who knows how many lives she's affected? Who knows how far reaching her ministry actually went? Her ministry lives on. She planted seed in some of those people's lives. In some of those people's lives, she watered. In some of their lives, she cultivated or de-weeded. In some of their lives, she reaped the harvest. This is what we can learn from her. We shouldn't prejudge whether somebody will receive it or not receive it. We need to just do what Yahweh told us to do, which is go and preach the gospel. Sister Eleanor was a watchman over the church. She always had time. When she used to fall out in the spirit, it was through laughter. As old as she was, she used to laugh and crack up and roll on the floor laughing. In, in a dress, right? In a dress. I mean, and it was a contagious kind of thing. When you saw it, you start cracking up laughing. It was a contagious kind of thing. She had the joy of Yahweh in her life, even through her suffering in the end. Because she was sick for a long time and down for a long time, she still had the joy of Yahweh in her life. Sister Eleanor. Norma Jean Anthony. Mom. Norma was the most virtuous woman I've ever met in my life. She was kind-hearted and humble 
and she loved on people. And she, she was a warrior, but she was a warrior. She would pray for you. I mean, she would stay in the trenches in prayer for her, the people she loved. The greatest, the greatest legacy she left me is when she got cancer. You know, because at that time I was still somewhat baby in my faith. I had faith, but it was kind of like, you know, not shored up. And when she got cancer, I was mad. I remember being mad at Yahweh. Like, why is this happening to her? She's so, you know, she's so righteous, and good, and, and she's older. Like, why is this happening to her, you know? And I was one of her caregivers. And Norma never once said, why is this happening to me? Never. And I used to watch her, and, and people would come to the house to visit her, to encourage her, to lift her up, to pray with her. And she would pray for them and encourage them and lift them up, and they would leave better than they came. And she showed me that no matter what happens in your life, Yahweh's still worthy, Yahweh still gets the glory. It doesn't matter what's going on in my life or what's going on around me, Yahweh is worthy. One of the most amazing things I've seen happen in her life is she had a brain aneurysm. She had to learn how to eat again, how to read again, how to talk, how to walk. She couldn't do those things. But she could sing the praises of Yahweh. She could sing the praises of Yahweh. She couldn't talk a sentence. Her words would get lost on her. But she could sing every word in the praises of Yahweh. I'm talking about somebody who forgot everything. She didn't know how to walk anymore or feed herself or use the bathroom. Nothing. But people would come and sing her, and she would sing the praises of Yahweh. It was so much a part of who she was. It never got lost. True, saving, faith. She could be in the hall of faith, hallelujah. True, saving faith. Her legacy to her children. Live for Yahweh, and everything will be all right. It don't matter what it looks like. Live for Yahweh, and everything will be all right. Sister Norma Jean Anthony, Sylvester, our pastor, the head. Sylvester loved Yahweh with his whole heart, mind, soul, and strength. He loved Yahweh, and he pushed us, and he encouraged us to come out of our comfort zone. And he, he would call you out if you weren't singing and praising. And he would stop the whole service and he would say, sing it by yourself. Because he wanted you to praise Yahweh and give Yahweh his due. Yahweh was first and foremost. He didn't let people take up a seat and not enter into the worship. He would call you out if you did that. He would call you out and tell you you had to pray out loud. And people would be like, oh, kind of like what Micah does now calling people out to pray, but he's encouraging you to step out of your comfort zone, step out of your box, give Yahweh the glory, give him his due. Sylvester put his blood, sweat, and tears into this church. This church, he basically bought and paid for it with his own money. He mortgaged his house, and he bought this church and as old as he was, he was in this church fixing stuff and doing, I mean, if you run into a random piece of duct tape in here, know that he had his hands in it. I mean, he just, he loved the church. And one of the last times that I seen him, he said to me, Denise, where will the church be in five years? I looked at him and I said, as long as we got breath in our body, the church doors will be open. The church will be open. If it's just me and my household, the church doors will be open. This is his legacy, saints. This church, he built it up. He poured love into every soul that was here. Today we honor our soldiers, the saints of the congregation of Yeshua who died in active duty, who have gone on before us, who are now counted in the cloud of witnesses. And one day we all will join them. 
if we die in Yahshua. Blessed are the dead who die in Yahshua. Hallelujah.